Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Welcome. If you know Mary, you know Jesus. Good evening, everyone. Glad to be back this week. My name is Bob Cantoni, hosting this show, and how to get to know the mother of Jesus and the importance of why we need to get to know the mother of Jesus, to get to know her son, uh, more and more, to fall more and more in love with her son, Jesus, so that she could help us to become perfect imitators of Christ, perfect imitators of Jesus. And I'm hoping that this show and what we teach here and, and the, the knowledge that I share with you achieves that. And I'm hoping that I can spark a desire for all listening to get to know the mother of Jesus and consecrate yourself to her immaculate heart so that she could bring you, as Jesus taught us from Fatima, bring you and I to the perfect consecration of her son, Jesus. We've got a lot to talk about tonight. For the past few weeks, we've been talking about uh, what consecration to the Immaculate Heart of Mary is, what is expected of us, how do we live out our consecration, and what Mary does for us. I'll give a recap on what we talked about for the past few weeks. Um, a little bit on what that is, and also um, I want to talk about, as promised, the seven things we should never do in our devotion to Mary. And these are words of St. Louis de Montfort in his uh, spiritual uh, teaching and in Marian consecration. There is such a thing as false devotion to Mary, and it's very dangerous. And I'd like to touch on that tonight as well and uh, hopefully spark that sincere devotion to Mary, sincere consecration, and really mean it, because it is a powerful way to sanctification. It is a powerful way to the heart of Jesus and unity with the heart of Jesus, perfect consecration to the sacred heart of Jesus, and it is a powerful way, an easy way, or the easiest way, the surest way, um, and the, the most beautiful way to unity with the divine will, which we're going to talk about in upcoming uh, shows, upcoming weeks. I wish I could talk about it tonight because it is absolutely incredible. Uh, in the divine will, uh, the writings of Louisa Picaretta, the, the little daughter of the divine will. But that's for next time. Why don't we uh, begin with a prayer, and then we'll get to our scripture meditation and our recap. So, as, as always, we begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, come by means of the most powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your well-beloved spouse. Dear Immaculate Mother, again, we're with you this week. We beg your intercession. We ask you to come and pray with us, be with us, intercede for us. Surround us all, and especially everyone listening, this radio show with, your, with your, uh, the, the mantle of, your heavenly mantle of grace. Maybe we, we all be shielded and protected in the shield of your immaculate conception. We ask you, dear Mother, to help us to open our hearts and minds to all the Holy Spirit desires to teach us so that we can, we can bring us to uh, what it means to be sincerely consecrated souls, consecrated children, pleasing to the Mother so we can be pleasing to the Son and, and by being pleasing to the Son, be pleasing to the Father that you help us become other Christ in your tender and your awesome, loving, motherly care. So we ask this in the name of Jesus through the intercession of St. Joseph as well. We ask you, St. Joseph, to pray with us and be with us in a special way today and always to help us on that journey. Help us to have that, that true devotion to Jesus and Mary that you had to Jesus and Mary. In Jesus' name we pray. And we'll pray the prayer of St. John Paul II, Totus Tuus. And it's a beautiful prayer of asking our Blessed Mother to possess our soul. 
Immaculate Conception, Mary, my mother, live in me, act in me, speak in me, and through me. Think your thoughts in my mind and love through my heart. Give me your dispositions and feelings. Teach, lead me, and guide me to Jesus. Correct, enlighten, and expand my thoughts and behavior. Possess my soul. Take over my entire personality and life. Replace it with yourself. Incline me to constant adoration. Pray in me and through me. Come live in, let me live in you and keep me in this union always. Come Holy Spirit living in Mary, help me to make this consecration with generosity and zeal. Come Holy Spirit living in Mary, help me to give myself entirely to Jesus through Mary. Amen. And St. John Paul too, please come and pray for us, be with us, inspire us, and uh, use your inspiration and your, um, your, your prayers to help us with this consecration as you understood it and lived it. Amen. So what I'd like to do at this moment is, first of all, what consecration is, it simply means giving Mary, our mother, our Heavenly Mother, our spiritual mother, giving her permission to mother us into another Jesus, into another Christ. We, we, she mothers us into another Jesus, but we want to be docile to her motherly care, motherly teaching, motherly guidance. We need to be docile to what she's asking us to do because she's the spouse of the Holy Spirit. It is really the Holy Spirit that's the sanctifier. But Mary works in union with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit works in union with Mary. The, Mary and the Holy Spirit are one. There is no separation of Mary and the Holy Spirit. So as our wonderful, loving, tender mother, she wants only what is best for us, and that is to bring us to Jesus, to the total consecration to his sacred heart, by consecration to her immaculate heart, where she can mother us, teach us, form us, guide us, pray for us, you name it. When we give surrender everything to Mary, she will form us into another Christ and lead us to that sanctification so that we can become, like today's gospel, which I'm going to talk about, become perfect, like our Heavenly Father is perfect. It's a beautiful uh, gospel today in the liturgical, uh, in the liturgy of the Catholic Church. And I'll read that in just a moment. So that's what consecration is. And let's go to the Marian Movement of Priests, where Our Lady gives a brief description of what she will do when we consecrate ourselves and take it seriously and mean it. The more we take it seriously, says St. Louis de Montfort, the more Mary takes our consecration seriously and the more she can move and act to bring to that realization uh, that we just described. So this is what she says. To everyone who consecrates himself or herself to me, I again promise salvation, safety from error. That is so important, especially in this day and age. We live in a time of incredible error. It's spreading like, like the smoke of Satan, our, our Blessed Mother tells us. The smoke of Satan, that spirit of error that's leading many to, to, to uh, the destruction of their faith, leading many to, re, um, to renounce their faith or give up their faith or, re, or, or ignore and reject their faith, to leave their faith. That's what the spirit of error does, and the devil is behind the spirit of error. He's the father of lies. So our Blessed Mother promises through our consecration safety from that error so that she could keep us under the shelter of the truth, the truth that Jesus promised when he said, I will send the advocate, the spirit of my Father, the spirit of truth, who will teach you all things and remind you of all that I taught you. What a beautiful gift that is. So, a promise of safety from error in this world and eternal salvation, she says. You will obtain this through my special motherly intervention. Thus, I will prevent you from falling into the enticements of Satan. Mary's greatest role, to crush the head of the serpent, 
You will be protected and defended by me personally. You will be consoled and strengthened by me. Those are beautiful promises by Our Lady, and it is so true. It is so true. You shall see when you decide to be consecrated to her immaculate heart that these words that I'm speaking are absolutely true. So those are the promises, some of the promises which are laid. There's many, many more, but I just want to be brief tonight so we can cover um, what I promised in this show. Now I would like to go to St. Louis de Montfort's preparation for total consecration according to St. Louis Marie de Montfort. Beautiful, beautiful consecration. So it's very... Um, potent and very potent with knowledge on Mary and what to do. And uh, St. Louis happens to be the champion of Marian consecration. He knew it all too well. And how did he know that? He understood what it meant to be consecrated. He was a consecrated, a sincere consecrated soul himself to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And Mary and her spouse, the Spirit of Truth, taught her all these things, as Jesus promised. So this is what he says in his consecration. In the 32nd day, and uh, on page 73, and it's taken from True Devotion, uh, pages 257 through 260, and he says, there are also some very sanctifying interior practices for those whom the Holy Ghost calls to a high perfection. These may be expressed in four words. To do all our actions by Mary, with Mary, and for Mary. In Mary and for Mary. So that we may do them all more perfectly by Jesus with Jesus, in Jesus, and for Jesus. So it truly is to Jesus through Mary, and that is her greatest delight and her, her main focus. I guarantee it. By Mary, we must obey her in all things, in all things conduct ourselves by her Spirit, which is the Holy Spirit of God. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God, those who are led by the Spirit of Mary are the children of Mary. And among the clients of Mary, none are true or faithful, but those who are led by her Spirit. Now, these are words of a great Marian saint, St. Louis de Montfort, which St. Pope John Paul II took very seriously. When he went to visit, St. Louis de Montfort's tomb, it was all over for him. He was hook, line, and sinker and brought into Marian consecration and even said so much that it is indispensable that all of us consecrate, especially their priest sons, consecrate themselves to her immaculate heart, especially in this day and age. It is indispensable. So... Mary and among the clients of Mary, none are true or faithful. So there are false ways of devotion to Mary. He says none are true or faithful, but those who are led by her spirit. Jesus has rendered himself so completely the master of Mary that he has become her own spirit. A soul is happy indeed when it is all possessed and overruled by the spirit of Mary, a spirit meek and strong, zealous and prudent, humble and courageous, pure and fruitful. These are powerful words right out of the gospel. The spirit of Mary is very clear. It's the spirit of the Holy Spirit. They cannot be any different they are one, one in will, one in heart, one in mind, one in spirit. They are one. They think and act and do in unison, in unity. One cannot do something different than the other. 
it just makes perfect sense that the Spirit of Mary is united with the Spirit of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit. And later on, in the upcoming weeks in the divine will, it speaks of how the, while being one with the will of God, we are one with his thoughts, one with his words, one with his acts, one with his will, one with his heart and his love. And Mary truly is, in a, the most perfect way, united with the divine will, the will of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth. It is so simple and it is so logical that it cannot be anything other than true than what I'm saying. And these are words of St. Louis de Montfort. A soul is happy indeed when it is all possessed and overruled by the spirit of Mary. A spirit meek and strong, zealous and prudent, humble and courageous, pure and fruitful. Sounds very much like a, a soul that is that is under the influence and united with the Holy Spirit of God. We must do our actions with Mary. We must consider in every action how Mary has done it. She being in our place. For this end, we must meditate on the great virtues which she practiced during her life. First of all, her lively faith by which she believed without hesitation the angel's words, word, and believe faithfully and constantly up to the foot of the cross. Her profound humility, which made her hide, her, which made her hide herself, hold her peace, submit to everything, and put herself last of all. Ever wonder why she's not as mentioned as much as you would think in the gospel? It's because of her profound humility. She hid herself and she requested that of her son. She wanted all the glory to be for her son. Why? Because she puts herself last of all, always. She, like John the Baptist, says constantly, even at this moment, I must decrease and he must increase. It's very simple. So what a beautiful queen mother we have and what beautiful words by St. Louis de Montfort in teaching us the benefits of being consecrated to Mary and what a true devoted, consecrated soul is to do. He also tells us that a consecrated soul should pray the rosary daily. Strive to pray the rosary daily. It is our Blessed Mother's favorite prayer. It is a powerful weapon against evil. It is a powerful weapon. It has the power to convert the most hardened of hearts. It has the power to crush all heresies. It is the chain which St. Michael will chain the evil one and cast him into the eternal fires of hell and chain him there forever, the chain of the rosary. Why? Because it is, the, it is rooted directly in the gospel of our Lord. It is rooted directly in, in a meditation on and a prayer of the lives of Jesus and Mary. It's that simple. It is the truth, the two-edged sword. And it is a prayer that is not only a meditation on the gospel and in the gospel message, but we are praying the gospel in the rosary. You have the angelic salutation. Hail Mary, full of grace, the words of St. Saint Elizabeth and St. Gabriel, the archangel. Hail, full of grace, blessed are you among women, of St. Elizabeth, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. For the moment your voice, Mary, sounded in my ears, the babe leapt for joy. Why? Because it's the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, speaking through her and sanctifying John the Baptist in the womb of St. Elizabeth. We have the Lord's Prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth, on earth, not just in heaven, but on earth as it is in heaven. This is the gospel message. God wants us 
to live in his divine will the way it was before the fall of Adam and Eve on earth. He wants to restore it to its former glory, to humanity's former innocence, restore it to its original innocence, I should say, and beyond. Believe me, believe you me, because the Catholic Church teaches that the fall of Adam was an old happy fall, an old happy fall, meaning that Jesus, doing what he did in his divinity, merited far more than what Adam could have merited for humanity should he have not fallen. In fact, it goes on even further in the divine will that Jesus merited for humanity that we become partakers of divine nature. That's huge. So I'm so excited about sharing with you the divine will because that's really what God is really talking about and trying to explain, well, not trying, but God is explaining in a very beautiful way, in his way, in a way that we can understand what it means to be united with the divine will of God. It's incredible. Incredible. So I'm looking forward to that, and I hope it sparks some interest so that you keep coming back and hearing what we have to say. So, those are words on what consecration is, what is expected, what we ought to do, and what St. Louis de Montfort shares and what, it, what a consecrated soul um, is expected to do in Mary, through Mary, and so that she could bring us to the uh, consecration to the sacred heart of Jesus. So let's go to our gospel reading for today and see how all this ties in together. So it's taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 43 through 48. And Jesus says, You have heard that it hath been said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemies, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that persecute and calumniate you. that you may be the children of your Father who is in heaven, who makes the sun to rise upon the good and bad and rain upon the just and the unjust. For if you love them that love you, what reward shall you have? Do not even the, the publicans do this? And if you salute your brethren only, what do you do more? Do not also the heathens do this? Be you therefore perfect also, as also your heavenly Father is perfect. What a powerful gospel. And it kind of leaves you scratching your head and like, oh my goodness, how am I supposed to be as perfect as the Father? It, it, that's impossible. And I could see how others might be thinking the same thing. Are you kidding me? Be perfect as the Father? That's impossible as imperfect as I am, especially under the effects of original sin and all of my faults, my weaknesses, my imperfections, my miseries. Are you kidding? My sins? How am I on earth supposed to do that? Well, I heard from a beautiful priest this morning. He gave a, a beautiful homily, and he explained it this way. The original he, uh, Aramaic he says this translation is, is not as accurate as it is written. But the original Aramaic translated it as thus. Since it is impossible for us to be perfect as our Heavenly Father perfect, is perfect, it should have read this way, that doing all that Jesus taught on the Sermon of the Mount, which preceded this gospel today, the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount, doing all that Jesus taught and living it and sincerely striving to do it, we will be moving towards that perfection. We will be beginning to be perfect as our Father in Heaven is perfect. Now, there's no way we can outdo the perfection of God. It's, that's just, that's crazy. There's just no way. But we can imitate God with the help of the Holy Spirit, with the help of God's grace, with the help of the Word of God, with the help of the Mother of God, 
and with all the angels and saints, we can strive to do that. St. Paul tells us we must work out our salvation. We must put on the new, put on the mind of Christ, put off the old man and become a new creation in Christ. But I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. There's no excuses. God promises, Jesus promises to help us. He never said it was easy, but he gave us the church and the sacraments of the church as incredible aids to our sanctification, as an incredible aid of grace. See, the sacraments, especially the Eucharist, are, the Eucharist are outward signs of sanctifying grace in the presence of the true presence of Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity, where I could point there is the Lamb of God, an outward sign. I can go into a church and genuflect and say with incredible reverence and sincerity and bow in awe and say, my Lord and my God, and I know he is truly present there in the tabernacle or in the monstrance in the, under the presence, under the veil of bread and wine, truly present, body, blood, soul, and divinity. These are all aids, the sacrament of reconciliation, to get back into the grace of God so we can receive the bread of life worthily. And that will strengthen us in our journey toward this sanctification, towards the kingdom of God, so that Christ, God's will can reign in us on earth as it is in heaven. So be perfect means... We will become more perfect. We will be brought to that perfection. Uh, we can begin to be perfect like the Father is in heaven is perfect. And once we are united with God in heaven, yes, we will be perfect, says St. John. We will be just like him because we will see him as he truly is. Wow. Incredible stuff. Thank you, God. I can't thank you, Lord Jesus, enough. When you gave us so lovingly, hanging on the cross, this beautiful queen mother, our beautiful, humble, tender, loving, spiritual mother, as she is such a powerful guide in a powerful way and in a, a, a secure way to this sanctification. In the loving arms of our mother who will refuse to let any of her children go, Thank you, Lord Jesus, from the bottom of my heart. I can't thank you enough, Lord, and I love you and praise you and adore you with all my heart. You know, St. Louis also tells us that consecration to the Immaculate Heart of Mary brings us to an attitude of gratitude. How true that is, I cannot thank God enough. It is in the praise and thanksgiving that we grow most Especially we, get, uh, we, we enjoy God's pr protection. We enjoy um, growing in the spiritual life. We benefit incredibly. It brings joy to the heart of God. And he just lavishes us with his divine life and grace in the praise and thanksgiving. So this angelic salutation in the rosary is a prayer of praise. Hail, full of grace, blessed are you among women. And blessed is the fruit of your womb. You're not only praising Jesus, you're praising his mother. It's a prayer of praise. Prayer of praise. Good stuff. So that's really uh, another, another benefit of being consecrated to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. She will bring us to that. Be perfect as your Father in, in heaven is perfect, the way our Lord taught, so that we can be pleasing and bear much fruit. In this way, my Father is glorified, that we bear fruit. And St. Louis tells us that we must imitate Mary and look to her because she is the most fruitful of all. Good stuff. So, consecration to Mary and devotion to Mary, the rosary, St. Louis also teaches us to do the, uh, the litany of the Holy Spirit, which is powerful, do the, uh, the Amini Christi, which is by St. Louis, uh, St. Ignatius Loyola, and the um, Ave Maria Stella, which is a beautiful prayer. You know, that keeps us 
reminded of Mary and in the spirit of Mary and, and, and helps us to, to run to Mary and so forth. And one other thing I want to mention, too, is from Father Gately's consecration, 33 Days to Morning Glory, just briefly what he says that we ought to do as consecrated souls to help to deepen our consecration. It's beautiful. And this is what he says. This is Father Gately. As soon as Mary hears us make such a decision of consecration, she flies to us and begins working a masterpiece of grace within our souls. She continues this work for as long as we don't deliberately choose to change our choice from a yes to a no. Mary, like God, she respects our free will. As long as we don't take back our permission and leave her, then be, that being said, it is always a good idea for us to strive to deepen our yes to Mary. For the deeper our yes becomes, the more marvelously she can perform her works of grace in our souls. Now we have to remember, Mary's the spouse of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the sanctifier. They, Mary and the Holy Spirit are working in cooperation with one another. It's a beautiful thing, and she is our perfect model of what it means to live in the divine will of God and, in, and be a partaker of divine nature. Boy, am I so looking forward to that. Uh, writings on Louisa. This is exactly what I'm talking about in those writings. You'll hear about it in the, next, in the upcoming coming shows. For the deeper our yes becomes, the more marvelously she can perform her works of grace in our souls. One of the greatest aspects of being consecrated to Mary is that she's such a gentle mother. She makes the lessons of the cross into something sweet. And she pours her motherly love and solace into our every wound. Going to her and giving her permission to do her job truly is the surest easiest, shortest, and the most perfect means to becoming a saint. What joy it is to be consecrated to Jesus through Mary. Well, St. Louis said something very similar, or he says something very similar in The Secret of Mary. He says, happy indeed, sublimely happy are those souls whom the Holy Spirit imparts true knowledge of Mary. Well, it's beautiful, beautiful uh, gift by God, and we ask Our Lady to intercede for all of us to inspire us, inspire in our hearts to make this consecration and to live it out as fully ca- as, as we are capably are, with her help and the help of God's grace. Amen. So though, that, that is what true devotion to Mary is. That is what sincere devotion is and how we must act as children of Mary, children of God, in that docility to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, acting in Mary and uh, living out that consecration so that she can make us saints, form us into great saints even. So let's talk about what the seven things we should never do in our devotion to Mary. Again, these are taken from the writings of St. Louis de Montfort, and he warns us. And this is, some of it is pretty, um, is pretty sobering, what he says. So we need to be aware of this, and, um, and if, if we are partaking of this kind of devotion, we need to ask our Blessed Mother to help us to inquire, uh, to um, aspire to true devotion to help us to detach from what we thought was true devotion and it's really false, and she can attach us and teach us what true devotion really means and what it really is and how it, can, how it must be lived out. So this is what St. Louis warns us. He says, There are, at this time, more than ever, false devotions to our Blessed Lady, which is easy to mistake for true ones. Okay? He says... False devotion is easy to make mistake for true ones. So that's the danger. 
He says the devil, like a counterfeiter and a subtle and experienced deceiver, has already deceived and destroyed so many souls by a false devotion to the Blessed Virgin. Wow. That he makes a daily use of his diabolical experience to plunge many others by this same way into everlasting perdition. Isn't that interesting? In a way, he's saying that the devil, his greatest adversary, Mary, they are arch enemies. God the Father said in the beginning, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. The devil is turning it around and using Mary as a tool to bring us down. He is the master of all deception, the art of deception. We need to be aware. We need to take this very seriously, and we need to learn to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking through Mary. If we hear the voice of Mary like St. Elizabeth, our hearts and souls and being will leap for joy like the John the Baptist did in the womb of Elizabeth. We should be filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit. When Mary speaks, we need to learn to listen to what her voice sounds like and be attentive to it and act upon it. Because the devil's a great deceiver and he will use even Mary against us. So St. Louis goes on to say, as a counterfeiter, as a counterfeiter does not ordinarily counterfeit anything but gold and silver or very rarely the other metals because they are not worth the trouble. So the evil spirit does not, for the most part, counterfeit the other devotions, but only those to Jesus and Mary. The devotion to Holy Communion and to our Blessed Lady the devil wants to rob us of this devotion. He wants to discourage us, to especially devotion to the Eucharist and our Blessed Lady. He wants to make devotion to Mary look like you're doing something wrong. He wants to make devotion to Mary obscured so that we obtain a false devotion. We, need to, we really need to be in tune with the voice of Mary, the voice of the Holy Spirit, so that she could shield us from this spirit of error, as she promised, in sincere consecration to her Immaculate Heart. Because they are among other devotions, what gold and silver are amongst metals. So the devotion to Jesus and Mary are the, the primary devotions that lead us to sanctification where we cannot do without one or the other. We cannot. St. John Bosco described in his dream where there were two pillars, two columns that were supporting one on the top of one column was the Eucharist, Jesus in the Eucharist. The other one was a statue, was an image of Our Lady of Grace. They were on two columns and the Pope was steering the ship, the Holy Roman Catholic Church, or the whole Catholic Church through them two columns. And they were being uh, attacked from every side by these little ships. Of course, there was other little ships assisting the Pope in this big ship through those two columns. But the seas were very stormy. But on the other side, between the two columns, it was calm sea. It was heavenly sea. But the, nevertheless, Jesus, the Eucharistic presence of Christ, was on one pillar. And Mary was on the other. Mary was a little lower than the Eucharist. Why? Because she's submissive to Christ, who is also God. She is a creature. She is not God. She is submissive to God. But nevertheless, she is a pillar. We must not be, uh, reject devotion to Mary because it's the devil is able to remove one of those pillars in your life, what do you think would happen to the rest of the building? It will come crashing down. We cannot do without one without the other. We can't. And St. Louis is explaining it very clearly here. So, 
And even though St. Louis mentions seven things you must avoid in your devotion to Mary, he doesn't go into great detail, all right? But he's explaining it with enough detail so we know what to avoid and uh, what, to, what, to, um, yeah, what to avoid. So he admits, St. Louis, I have now said many things about the Most Holy Virgin, but I have many more to say, and there are infinitely more which I shall omit. Whether from ignorance, inability, or want of time in the design which I have to perform a true client of Mary and a true disciple of Jesus Christ. Thankfully, the renowned Montfort Father, Armand Plessis, took upon himself the task of explaining his saintly founder's teaching, meaning St. Louis de Montfort's teaching. And this is the way he spells it out. It's taken from the commentary on the treaties on the true devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary by St. Louis de Montfort. So the first false devotion he titles and he calls the critical devotees. He says, this class of false devotees is composed most often of proud, and self-important spirits who are very attached to their own judgment, incapable of understanding the simple and naive confidence which we can, without any superstition, have in merit. They boast about their knowledge, true or feigned. They find fault in all the practices of devotion because they do not suit their fancy They reject all accounts about miracles and favors obtained because these accounts are not authentic. They see obvious exaggerations in the praises which the fathers attribute to Mary. But who are the fathers? Those are the fathers of the church, the ones who were taught by the apostles, who knew Mary. So he's saying they're judgmental, they're proud, and they are incapable of understanding the simple and naive confidence which we can without any superstition to marry. So in other words, we must not have devotion thinking that if I pray a thousand rosaries, some sort of uh, magical power in them is going to uh, uh, assist me in what I'm asking for. I see people who wear the rosary around their neck. Not that it's a bad thing, but the intent that they're doing it for is a bad thing. They're thinking that. One man told me, I asked him, why do you wear your rosary beads around your neck? He says, well, he says, when I was younger, I had encounters with aliens. And they, the rosary beads are like a lucky charm to protect me against aliens. That is an example of false devotion to Mary, a trick of the devil to make it look like it's a charm, a lucky charm. So anyways, in that way, it would discourage devotion to the rosary because many would say, see the Catholics praying the rosary? It's a lucky charm. So we need to be aware of the, the, um, the trickery of the devil. All right, so these people here, the critical devotees are really um, what I would call clueless (laughs) know-it-alls. They haven't got a clue what they're talking about, but yet they act as if they know everything. All right, so we need to avoid that. That's rooted in egoism. And we need to follow a spirit of Mary, which is profound humility, and ask her to help us with that and teaches that. The second one is the scrupulous devotee. They object forcibly to devotion to the Blessed Virgin. They object forcibly under the pretext that Jesus Christ must be the only end of our all our devotion. Now, our Blessed Mother complains extensively about this in her Mary Movement of Priests. She says, somehow, many of my priest sons And many, many uh, faithful believe that overemphasis and devotion to her Immaculate Heart and consecration 
somehow casts a shadow on the glory and honor due to her son alone. Well, this is exactly what St. Louis the Mont is talking about, and he called it the scrupulous devotee. And it's a trick of the devil. According to them, indeed, devotion to Mary is an obstacle, the devotion that is due to our Lord. It is not, I would say, souls that believe this way, how deceived you are. How deceived you are. How deceived you are. We dishonor the son by honoring the mother. We lower the one by raising the other. Not true, not true, not true. Devotion to Mary brings us to sanctification and perfect uh, um, consecration to the sacred heart of her son. Mary can only do one thing as the spouse of the Holy Spirit, form us into other Christ pleasing to the Father. Because the Holy Spirit is the sanctifier. Don't let the devil trick us into this way of devotion, scrupulosity. Hence, they find excessive the praises that are addressed to Mary or the multitudes who hurry to her altar. They consider as wasted time and foolishness the traditional marks by which the Christian people have always expressed their devotion to Mary. I see that all the time. I hear that from a lot of, even Catholics. Even Catholics, I hear, oh, no, no, I, it's all for Jesus. Oh, no. But I do pray the rosary. But this is how, what Our Lady's talking about, how the devil has obscured the truth about Mary. He has obscured it, means clouded it, which is even worse than if you totally rejected her completely. It's worse. Because an obscurity usually comes from a person of credibility or maybe the authority in the church. Where people, where they'll say, well, rosary, pray to rosary is good, but it's really not all that necessary. That's being obscured. St. Louis teaches us that happy indeed, sublimely happy, are those souls whom the Holy Spirit imparts true knowledge of Mary. When they, when someone says that, well, it's not all that important to be devoted to Mary, although it's a good practice. But overemphasis really takes away from the glory of her son. That's obscured, and it's a lie from the devil. And St. Louis de Montfort says it very clearly here. The third is the external devotee. Montfort will admit later that the exterior practices of devotion are necessary, meaning like praying your, 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 your rosary and your Hail Marys aloud, out loud and other uh, litany uh, of Loretto, litanies to Our Lady, Ave Maria Stella, the, the litany of the Holy Spirit, such things like that. Uh, a, a devotion to Our Lady of Sorrows, which is so powerful, the seven sorrows of Our Lady. But he also says they are precisely to arouse, sustain, and develop the interior devotion. It truly is about the interior life and meditation interiorly, where we find God. The kingdom of heaven is within you. Whoever makes the devotion consist only in these exterior practices breaks this necessary unity and kills true devotion. So I can't just rattle my Hail Marys off and thinking that I'm doing something good and holy. Hail Mary, for grace, the Lord, be blessed out thou among women, blessed fruit of thine. Uh-uh. Someone called that the chainsaw or the, 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 the machine gun rosary. Hail Mary, for the grace, the Lord, is with thee. No, we must interiorize this. What I do is I envision Mary standing right in front of me. And, and with each Hail Mary, as I complete it, I hand her a rose, a red rose with love. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Okay. Pray like we're talking to a person because we really are, with love. So he goes on to say these souls that are um, external devotees, they only act then out of mechanical routine. It is necessary to say plenty of rosaries. There you go. 
to hear a great number of masses to join all the confraternities, but without the soul having the slightest part in all these practices. That's exterior. Exterior devotees enjoy only the sensible part of these devotions. They become attached to them as long as they, the sensible endures. As soon as it stops, they completely lose heart. So it's really not taking root on that good soil as our Lord has taught. You know, uh, the soil of the heart where you will bear fruit uh, uh, 30 and 60 and 100 fold. So we must interiorize this devotion and all devotions to Our Lady and, and be sincere about it. Otherwise, we're paying God lip service and Mary lip service, and it's not pleasing. The, third, the fourth one is the presumptuous devotee. This class of false devotees is the least kind, the one that our saint treats most harsh, harshly. The presumptuous devotees, St. Louis the Moffat treats most harshly. Not only do they passionately indulge in all sorts of excess, but they, are, they inspire, they aspire indeed to continue thus till the end of their life. They dread only one thing because they are instructed and have faith, e and have faith. They, they dread only one thing, eternal damnation. And they ask of devotion. Marian devotion especially, only as an assurance against this disaster. So they're presuming upon that if I pray my rosaries, I will, I will escape eternal damnation, but I could go do whatever I want and still lead a sinful life and drink and, you know, um, go to seances or whatever. I'm just throwing examples. I'm not, I'm not saying that people do this, although they might. I could go, uh, I could gamble all I want. I could drink and get drunk and have fun and have a party. Um, I could get my palm read at, at carnivals and I could go to um, mediums and uh, psychics and all that. Uh-uh. I could smoke my marijuana and drink. No way. As long as you can't do that and pray the rosary and, and expect to escape uh, eternal damnation. And that's why St. Louis is speaking most harshly on this. They ask of devotion, Mary and devotion, especially only as an assurance against disaster, Mary is solely charged with obtaining for them a happy death. Let me tell you something. Mary, like God, respects the free will. And if we are choosing eternal damnation, she will not interfere with that. However, she probably is begging us to to depart from that and change our way and repent. She probably has sad, longing eyes, weeping copious tears, hoping you will respond to her invitation to true devotion to her Immaculate Heart. But she will not interfere with the free will, nor does God. God does not put us in eternal damnation. He doesn't choose it for us. We choose it for us. We choose it. But Mary helps us to make the right choices rooted in the truth, in the gospel, and the truth of the Holy Spirit of truth. As she is very charitable and very faithful, she will not fail to give them what they desire. They can thus rely on her for that. Sin at present in complete safety and taste without danger all the forbidden fruits. Therefore, Montfort protests energetically against such charges. Far from being the way of the church herself or of true devotees, this conduct and this presumption are altogether harmful and most reprehensible. One cannot say sincerely that he loves and honors Mary if he continues to offend her divine son. We need to repent and start living a life conformed to the gospel. Otherwise, it's very displeasing to God and so displeasing, it crucified him and butchered him and put him to death on a cross. One cannot say he sincerely loves and honors Mary if he continues to offend her divine son. If we take refuge under the mantle of the mother so as to be more sure of offending the son with impunity, oh my goodness, we need to guard against these things. The fifth devotee is the inconstant devotee. 
Ecclesiasticus, the book of Ecclesiasticus, puts this difference between the just man and the sinner, that a holy man continues in wisdom as the sun, but a fool is changed as the moon. The inconstant devotee is like the moon. The latter increases and decreases, appears and disappears, lives and dies almost at the same time. The same applies to the inconstant devotee. Sometimes they are fervent, sometimes lukewarm, sometimes they seem ready to undertake everything for the service of Mary. Then shortly after, they are no longer the same. They join every confraternity and follow the rules of none. So I look good, but I'm not... And on the exterior, I look good and holy, but interiorly, what's going on? Are we like the Pharisees? Such devotees are unworthy to be numbered among the servants of the virgin. Wow. We need to be guard against this one. Mary puts them under her feet like the moon which they resemble. On the contrary, her true servants share her constancy and fidelity. Well, we can't be wishy-washy. This is lukewarm. We cannot be straddling the fence one way or the other. We cannot. We need to be to get off the fence because guaranteed and Jesus promises us that one day we will find ourselves on the wrong side of the fence. Jesus, Jesus warns against lukewarmness. He says, I will vomit you from out of my mouth. That's not a very comfortable place to be when God is nauseated in that way. The sixth false devotion is the hypocritical devotee. This is the difference between the hypocritical devotees and the presumptuous devotee. The first are ashamed of their sins without having the courage to renounce them. That's the hypocritical or the presumptuous. They're ashamed of their sins without the courage to renounce them. The first, whereas the others do not hide from them at all. Wow. And would easily be scandalous. Furthermore, the presumptuous knows verity of his state before God. So there's hope to get back into the good graces with him at the last moment of his life. But I wouldn't want to be there. I wouldn't presume upon, oh, I could live as long, I could live and do whatever I want, and eh, at the end of my life, I'll beg God for his mercy and tell him I'm sorry. Uh Uh-uh. I would not presume. That's too dangerous. The hypocrite, on the contrary, intends only to shield himself from the judgment of men. Oh, that's the Pharisee. Some people go as far as to compromise their salvation. Pharisees for fear of losing the esteem of their confessor by sincerely admitting their sins at a time of death while causing less damage to Christian society. The hypocritical devotees are more in danger of being personally lost, and they are accordingly held in horror before God, who is essentially honesty and simplicity. For these false devotees, Mary's mantle serves to cover their sins and bad habits so that nobody can notice them. It also serves to make them pass for what they are not. That is to say, true devotees of Mary who put their private life in accord with their doctrine and their religious practices. That's hypocritical. We cannot use Mary and expect her to shield our sins. Uh Uh-uh. There's no way she is going to let us crucify her son with our sins, One, and for one. Number two, there's no way she's going to permit one of her prized children that Jesus, her son, suffered so dearly for to go to eternal perdition because their sins have not been repented of. There's no way she's going to cooperate in the work of saint. And finally... The self-interested devotees, the last category of false devotees includes those who allow themselves to be guided only by the interests of the moment and most often by temporal interests. In other words, I'm praying to Mary so that I could win the lotto, so I'll have it easier in my financial world. I'm praying to Mary so that I could have a wonderful house. I'm praying to Mary that I will be liked by everybody. 
these are vanities, and there's no way that Mary is going to honor those prayers because they're not good for the soul. They ask Mary only for graces of the material order to win trials or important business, to persevere or to recover health, to avoid danger, etc. And outside of these cases, they never think of praying to Mary. These souls forget that devotion, like prayer itself, has three other purposes as important as the request itself, veneration, gratitude, and reparation. I would also add conversion and repentance and conversion so that we become the saints that God wants us to become. They also forget that spiritual graces have more value than temporal graces. Therefore, they are not in favor in the sight of God and his holy mother. Wow. So these are words of St. Louis de Montfort who are warning us as a teaching what to avoid and what we must do, ask Our Lady to lead us to that true devotion to her. If we sincerely want to become that saint that God wants us to become, if we sincerely not only want to avoid eternal damnation, but we want to not offend God. That is the true fear of the Lord is that we love God so much that I don't want to hurt him with my sins or my ill behavior or false devotion to his mother or to the Eucharist. So we ask Our Lady for all these things, and we pray, dear Blessed Mother, through your immaculate heart. We thank you for all that you do for us, and we thank you for all the graces you obtain for us. Dear Mother Mary, bring us to that true devotion to your Immaculate Heart that is pleasing to your Immaculate Heart, that is pleasing to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, so that you can bring us to that sanctification, that oneness with the Heart of Christ, and that oneness with the will of God in the divine will and divine nature of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Good night, everyone. Until next time, may God bless all of you this week and always. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. God bless. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.